there and welcome to the problem of the day. So we are in the midst of thinking about cycles and the two most important kinds of cycles to think about are the cycles where we put some sort of energy in and get work out. We usually call those engines and usually what we're putting in is heat and what we're getting out is work. And then things where we put work into a system and expect to get a temperature change out. Those are called heat pumps or refrigerators. So in preparation for thinking about refrigerators, it's important for us to get a really good grip on thinking about compressors. And why is that? Well, refrigerators and heat pumps run with a working fluid that we call a refrigerant. And a refrigerant has to have a special property between the temperatures we are interested in working with. That is, you know, our cold temperature we want things to cool down to. We need to be able to get that fluid to boil where it's cold, which means uh, that's how it sucks energy out of the surroundings and keeps the refrigerator cold. And then we need it to condense where it's hot and reject its energy into the surroundings um, in order to keep the inside of the fridge or the house or whatever it is we're working with cold. That means we are changing the pressure of this fluid a lot so that it will boil at a low temperature and condense at a high temperature. Because, you know, that's sort of backwards of what we're used to. And that's why there's compressors involved. We've solved compressor problems before. We've solved them for steam, where we use the steam tables. We've solved them with ideal gas. Uh, but in this case, when we're working with a refrigerant, we could use the ideal gas assumption, assumption um, but we know that our working fluid is going to be near conditions where it condenses. And, well, that is not great for an ideal gas, right? Ideal gases never condense. And so we can manage this by knowing uh, at what conditions it does condense and adding in manually the enthalpy change for evaporation or condensation. Um, or we can use something that takes care of that automatically. So for example, uh, if we used an equation of state that was appropriate for our fluid, it would take care of all this for us and we'd just be able to get on with our day. Uh, we're not quite to uh, equations of state yet, and it can be tricky to find a good equation of state that matches exactly the properties of what we're doing. So perhaps we would use something like a table. We could make a steam table, but for a refrigerant. And this is something that exists and that uh, people do. And uh, that is nice for more sort of precise calculations because it can contain many decimal places of accuracy. But it doesn't really give you a feel for what you're doing in the design. It's hard to see how enthalpy changes when you do something with the temperature, for example. And that brings us to the way in which information for many refrigerants is communicated, at least for an initial design. If we want to do detailed design, we probably have to resort to an equation of state. But for initial design, we can use a graph which captures all of the same information that would be in a table. And this graph, we won't get as many decimal places of information out of it, but we will be able to see what is happening uh, with our material. So it's nice conceptually. So I want us to be able to read these graphs and uh, we're going to solve a compressor problem using one of these graphs. So we just want to know if we had some propane that was a saturated uh, liquid, or no, saturated liquid, saturated vapor at 0.1 megapascal, and we want to bring it up to 1.0 megapascal. So we want to compress it. Okay. And uh, then for the in-class part of this problem, we're going to redo it if the compressor is 80% efficient and what are our starting and end ending enthalpies in that case. So let's start out by writing uh, the energy and entropy balances for a compressor. And you've done this before, I hope. So we can say uh, delta H equals work. That's pretty good. Um, and then entropy, what's our uh, entropy balance here? Well. Uh, we know it's adiabatic, so there's not going to be a Q over T term. And, well, 
we're going to start just like we do with a turbine by assuming it's 100% efficient and then applying the efficiency afterwards. So to begin with, and I'll denote this with a prime, uh, delta S equals zero. So that means S1 equals S2. Okay, so here's our process. Uh, we are gonna figure out for our initial condition, 0.1 megapascal and saturated, what our starting enthalpy is. And then to get our ending enthalpy, we're going to need to determine the entropy of our starting condition, and then find where that same numeric value is true at 1.0 megapascals. Okay, so that, that's gonna be our travel. We are gonna travel from 0.1 to 0.2 uh, using constant entropy. So let's look at how we're gonna do that. So this is what's called a pH diagram, a pressure enthalpy diagram. It is for propane, which is our working fluid here, and it contains all the information that would be in something like the steam tables, but in this very compact graphical format. Uh, before we solve the problem, I'm gonna take you on a tour of how to read this, because I know it can be very intimidating. So I'm gonna use the highlighter for showing you some of the highlights. First, this thing here, this dome, is the phase envelope. So inside that phase, envelope dome, we have liquid and we have vapor mixed. Then out on this side of the dome is liquid. Think for a moment, you can figure out that that'll be true. And out on the other side, we have vapor. And up top, it's uh, super critical. And in the very corner over on this side, so this upper corner over here, um, no, let's see. Ah, there it is. <laughs> I'm pointing right at it, but it's in the corner all the way to that side. That's a solid and we're not gonna worry about that. Um, but that tells us uh, where our phase change is. And we have on the y-axis pressure. Uh, this uh, is from Elliot and Lyra. And we have on one side the pressure in English units and on the other we have it in our friend's SI units. So we're gonna use the SI units for pressure. And then on the top and the bottom, the y-axis is the enthalpy. So that's where the pH and pH diagram comes from. Uh, and we're gonna use the units up top, which uh, are again in SI units. All right, so we know from the Gibbs phase rule that once we know two things, say we know the, pr uh, the pressure and we know the enthalpy, then everything else that's a state function about this ought to be fixed. So the state functions that we might care about here are entropy, uh, volume or density, same difference, just flip of each other, and temperature. And it turns out that all these other lines, these squiggly lines going all over the place, those are the lines that tell us about those three other factors. So horizontal lines are constant pressure, vertical lines are constant enthalpy, and then these other lines are constant other things. So I'm gonna draw some more uh, lines in here to give you a look at them. All right, so we have temperature lines. Those can be a little tricky to spot. You might need to get in pretty close to follow me here, but I'm gonna follow the negative 220, and I think that's Fahrenheit line. It comes down, it hits the phase envelope, goes horizontal across the phase envelope, right? Because temperature and pressure and volume, um, got it, well, not volume. Temperature and pressure, sorry, not volume. Volume changes when you change phase. Temperature and pressure gotta be constant across the phase envelope. So we get out to the other side and then it kind of drops like a rock. So that is an isotherm. And some of the isotherms completely skip the phase envelope. Uh, so for example, here is another isotherm for 100 degrees and, and it's, uh, it's, out, it's out just over there. Okay, so uh, what are some of our other values we have going on here? Well, I'm gonna highlight also in green, a constant density line, which in this case, you know, uh, just one over specific volume. So that's a, a constant density line. That's nice, good to know what our density is. Uh, and then I'm gonna highlight one of these in black just to call that out. These, are the constant entropy lines. So there we go. We can see that any one point on here is going to be defined by having all of the state functions 
associated with it, right? So we just look at where these lines cross. So getting on to our problem, I'm going to use a straight edge and I am going to try my darndest and I recommend doing this with a real straight edge and a real piece of paper to draw to highlight for us approximately the constant pressure line for 0.1 megapascal. And I'm going to do that same thing approximately for 1 megapascal. So those are the two pressures we're working between. Okay, so that's nice. So our initial state then is where 0.1 megapascal hits saturated vapor. So it's going to be somewhere right, oh boy, right where I drew two lines uh, kind of on top of each other, but somewhere around in here. All right, so get in nice and close on your own graph. See if you agree with me. Use a real ruler. So if we want to see what the uh, enthalpy is there, so what is our H1, we're going to read up to the top of the graph and just see, you know, where does that cross the x-axis. And I'm getting it to be right around uh, 800, right? Do you see that's the, the vertical line? Maybe, uh, maybe a hair higher, maybe uh, 850, 825. Um, Make, we can make sure that you get in nice and close in the class. Um, and you see why doing detailed calculations, you would uh, prefer to use an equation of state, something where you get these values yourself. All right, that's nice. So we know H1. How are we going to find H2? Well, we know H2 will be, right, go back for a second, S1 must equal S2. So we've got to find our constant entropy line and then see where that intersects one megapascal. So if I get in really close and I look at my entropy lines, I see that, I'm going to use that black highlighter again, this is the constant entropy line that passes through my initial condition. Now, Actually, I look at it, it's a little bit off, so what I should properly do, probably, is uh, interpolate. Uh, but if, like I said, let's have uh, you repeat this with a ruler and make sure you're getting really close. But you can always interpolate between two lines because they have a, a nice shape. So you get out a pencil, you draw your own line. So we're really close to the 2.3 entropy line, which means that we're looking for where it intersects one megapascal and that line, so that's right about right here. And so that looks like H2 prime, right, reversible system, 1,000. So our work should be right around 200 kilojoules per kilogram, ish. And we can learn other information about this here too. So it's usually interesting to know what temperature we're at. So it looks like this, where this crosses is right between two different temperature lines. Uh, it looks like we've got the negative 50 and the negative 75 isotherms. So that's our high temperature, negative 50 or negative 75, because our low temperature uh, looks like our initial isotherm is negative 240. So propane, as you may guess, is something you would use as a refrigerant if you need your refrigerator to be very, very cold. So if you're storing vaccines for transport, for example, this might be the working fluid that you're using. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there, review this as much as you need to make sure you know how to read this graph. Uh, and then in class, we'll go ahead and take a shot at figuring out what happens if this uh, compressor is 80% efficient.